Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Paul Bar, and I'm a truly grateful recovering alcoholic. Hi, everybody. So, but one more day, by the grace of God, fellowshipping with men and women just like you, trying to follow the simple direction of the program called Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to take this opportunity to thank the committee and all you wonderful people for allowing me the privilege to be back down here with you again. It's a great privilege. I just love these conventions. Right here was the first convention I ever attended in my life. I think this was back in 76. And I'm grateful that I can be on the program today. I think it's only fair to tell you in the very beginning that I'm just a little bit old-fashioned and I'm kind of countryfied now. And the only reason I share that with you is you never would have noted if I hadn't told you. (laughs) Anytime I'm in a crowd this big, uh, I often wonder if there might be somebody here that knew me before I got to this fellowship. And this reminds me about an old buddy of mine that lived over in North Carolina. And he stole a man's milk cow, and they gave him 12 months in the chain gang. And when he finished his sentence, he was so ashamed of himself until he moved down in Georgia. And he got him a job, and he went to work, and he started attending a little old Baptist church down the road. And he established such a good record in the community and in the church until after a while they asked him to serve on the deacon board. And he served in that capacity for some time, and after a while the preacher resigned and asked this old buddy of mine if he'd be the preacher, and he accepted. And on the very first month, Sunday morning, he walked up in the pulpit to deliver his sermon. He looked down the aisle, and he saw a long-legged joker come walking in that he used to be in the chain gang with. And he started his sermon off something like this. Now, brothers and sisters, I came here this morning fully prepared to preach to you from the book of John. But after observing this great congregation, I have changed my text to the second chapter of Jude, where it says, if you know anything, or if you see anything that ain't already leaked out, you just keep your mouth shut now till this meeting's over, Will. <laughs> and we'll talk about it out yonder somewhere. <laughs> and that's the way it is with Po' Boy. <clears throat> City, I did quite a bit of researching before I found out there ain't no second chapter of Jude. <laughs> I don't know where that dude came up with that at, but it worked. Now, this typical-looking little old gray-headed uh, southern lady sitting here uh, in front of me is my wife. And she don't talk. She just follows me around and prays. <laughs> and thank God for that. I need all the help I can get. And every time I start to talk, old Flo, now, Flo ain't all that old. That's just a pet name. She calls me old po' boy. And she'll say, now, don't you tell them folks how old I am. I don't know what makes women like that. That's just the way they are. And, of course, I respect her wishes, and I just say, old Flo got here about the same time kerosene did. (laughs) (laughs) And that was back on in the days when castor oil was a wonder drug, sort of like penicillin, you know, when it came along. (laughs) Well, thank God we can laugh. I love to laugh. I love to see other people laugh. And as that book talks about it, the newcomer coming in here, if they saw no joy among these people, they wouldn't want it, would they? And this is attraction. It was attraction to me. 
And so I'm grateful to be here this evening. I thank what I'm up here for to share a little bit of my experience, strength, and hope with you. And trying to follow those directions in the big book that said our story disclosed in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. And I'd like to spend what little time I have up here talking about what it's like now. My friends, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm so glad that the God of my understanding let me live long enough to reach this beautiful fellowship. I never knew there was anything like this in the world. And I want to share something, especially with a newcomer. This is not a dead, dull, boring, and gloomy fellowship. It's beautiful. And I get excited about it. If you ain't never seen a Georgie conniption fit, you need to see poor boy have one. Sometimes I have one. When I get to thinking about where God brought me from and where I am today. If the good Lord lets me stay here till December, I'll be 73 years old. And I was born over here in Rockdale County, and that's where I live today. And my old daddy was a sharecropper and a moonshiner. And I guess we were about the poorest folks who were in Rockdale County. We lived in an old house over in the field. And I suppose by the time I was 10 years old, I could operate a liquor still as good as my old daddy could. I knew all the ingredients that went into a batch of beer that would cause it to ferment, and then when it was ready to be distilled. I learned that as a real young boy. And there's something else I remember. In this old house we lived in, in the kitchen, there was two jugs that always sat over in the corner of this old kitchen where we eat. And one of them was a jug of shine liquor, and the other one was a jug of sorghum syrup. So, <clears throat> other than becoming an alcoholic, I turned out to be quite a syrup sopper. <laughs> and there ain't nothing wrong with sopping this Georgia syrup. I don't know how old I was, but as a young boy, my dad moved us off to Atlanta. And we moved into a part of the city, they called it Cabbage Town. And if you're from Atlanta, I'm sure you know about Cabbage Town. It was then, and it is today, a real slummy era. The streets were not paved. And every little old boy that I began to associate with was a graduate from some reform school, or he was a candidate for some reform school. If he hadn't been, he was on his way. Now, we all know what it's like to be young at some time or another. We like to be accepted by the people that we're so closely associated with. And so I'm no different from anybody else. I wanted to be accepted, and I began to do the things that these other boys did. And I can remember when some of these kids did would buy them a bicycle. My old daddy, he was so poor he couldn't buy me one, and I'd steal one. And a little bit later on, some of these kids would... Their dad would get them an old hot rod, and my dad couldn't get me one, and I'd steal one of them, too. So I always had just as much as the rest of the kids, but mine was all hot. Now, they don't do this in Georgia today, but back in those days, they, they did, and I was 16 years old. And they had me up in that Fulton County courthouse. I found out that the law frowned on some of those things I was doing. And this was back in March of 1929. And I never will forget what that judge told my mama. He said, I'm going to send your boy to the chain gang. And I'm going to let him see what it's like out there. And then I'm going to turn him right back out. And I'm sure that your boy will be a better boy. And, of course, we would believe anything anybody told us, especially the judge. And so I went to the chain gang, and believe me, honey, it was back in the old chain gang days. And I expected to get out that night or no later than the next morning. That's what the judge said. But it didn't work that way. They kept me four years. <laughs> and so uh, mixing and mingling with the people that I was so closely associated with and wanting to be accepted 
by these people, I had become a real smart aleck. Now, I got another name for that. But you know what I'm talking about. I thought I had all the answers. I hated everything that stood for law and order, honesty, decency, and respectability. And this was the kind of person I was when I came back out on the streets of Atlanta. And, of course, I couldn't tell you how old I was when I had my first drink of liquor. I was probably in diapers. My whole family drank it. Everybody we know drank it. And we didn't see nothing wrong with it. And so I drank liquor day and night. If it was possible, it seemed like my mother, she was just more than mama. And then, like many mamas today, she upheld me in everything that I did. Her boy just couldn't do nothing wrong. And then, like many young men today, I took my mother for granted. I can remember so many times when she wouldn't have street car fare and she would walk in the rain or whatever down to this old chain gang camp and bring me a sack of bull durham smoking tobacco and say, Mama loves you and we hope they'll let you come home sometimes. But this was Mama. Mama's supposed to do these things. And I didn't miss her until it was too late because just a short time later in a drunken stupor on the outskirts of Atlanta, I wrecked an old automobile one night and I killed Mama. And I never got over that for a long time. My God, the guilt and the nightmares. And I could hear Mama crying and begging and pleading, begging me to slow that car down and I wouldn't do it. I was a smart aleck. And it was my fault and I lost Mama. I continued to drink liquor, and I began to run with some of the worst people in this country. A short time later, I was arrested, tried, and convicted, and sent to serve over a hundred years this time. And they sent me back to the Georgia chain gang. And my only hopes of ever being out again was to run out, and I run all my life and all over Georgia. Run, rabbit, run. So many of these men that I was so closely associated with they're not around today. Some of them were shot down and killed trying to escape. Some of them was killed out here on our street, the highway, by our policemen. And some of them went to the electric chair. So, my friends, it's by God's amazing grace that this old man stands here this evening and tries to share a little bit of my experience, strength, and hope with you. I violated every rule at the head. And this was back in the days when they used the old sweat boxes, the old stocks. And they whipped me with everything imaginable. And I continued to get worse. You don't win people like this. Sometimes somebody say, poor boy, how do you win them? There's a little four-letter word that says L-O-V-E, love. Thank God. For this kind of love that I'm talking about. Because I've seen it move men that you couldn't move with a Thompson submachine gun. And this is what began to make a difference in my life one day. I found out that somebody loved old poor boy. And how in the world they could have loved a person like me, I'll never understand. Now look at this sign up here. Love and fellowship. This is what it's all about. Thank God. Eventually, the federal government built a place over in Tattanoe County we call Reedsville, which is one of our state penitentiaries. The federal government built it and leased it to the state of Georgia and gave them 30 years to pay for it in. And the last year that Governor Eugene Talmadge was governor, he taken all the money out of the treasurer and he paid the government off. And the next morning, the headlines in the Atlanta Constitution said the state of Georgia now owns a state penitentiary lock, stock, and electric chair. And I was one of the first convicts to enter that new prison in October 1937. <clears throat> and they locked me up in a little cell for eight months until they could open up a rock quarry for incorrigibles over in Paulden County. And they sent me over there, and I remained over there for the next three years. But I managed to escape on two different occasions. 
And they sent me back to Reedsville under what they called a stop order, never to be transferred out again. <clears throat> I don't know how long it was, but it wasn't too long after that until we got a new new warden down there. And out of 2,500 convicts, he picked 10 of us with the worst escape records. And he said, carry these men to maximum security. They'll never come back to population as long as I'm warden. We had a lot of friends and we had a lot of connections. And 30 days later, we escaped from maximum security at midnight. We came downstairs and we captured the whole inside of the penitentiary. We taken over the front office, the powerhouse, the switchboard. Now, this never happened before, and it's never happened since then, but it did happen then. And I walked down through those cell blocks with a market basket full of keys, and I turned everybody out that said they wanted to run away. I must have let a hundred out. And so we threw that main switch, and we had a complete blackout. All the inside lights, the outside, the tower lights, all went out at one time. And there was 25 of us went out those big front doors and taking cars off of the yard. And we left. And the other 75 that I had let out, they went down and broke into the commissary and got all that juicy fruit chewing gum and brown mule chewing tobacco. They didn't want to just run away. They just wanted to steal something. They're full of larceny. <laughs> <clears throat> And the governor offered a thousand dollar reward, dead alive, for every one of us. And within another month's time, we were all back in jail somewhere, with the exception of one little old 17 year old boy. And he got drowned that night in the river. And so they started what they called an eight ball squad. Our head was shaven. We was placed in a detail, they call it the eight ball squad. We were segregated from the rest of the inmates placed out in a stump field digging stumps and every state trooper in the state of Georgia had to come down there 10 at a time and stay 10 days guard duty over this detail that they might know these men anywhere on site we were not allowed any visitors or any mail privileges and of course we had no money not even any lights in our cells so many of these men began to break their arms break their legs, and to cut their heel tendons, known as a heel string. And some of them crippled themselves for life. And the word got back to the, uh, the capital is how these men were crippling themselves, and the governor picked a group of men to come to Reesville, make an investigation and report back to Atlanta as to how to stop this. He picked the president of the Senate, Speaker of the House, a lot of judges, probation officers, newspaper reporters, and photographers. And one other man I'll never forget as long as I live. His name was Mr. Wiley J. Moore. And Mr. Moore was a millionaire banker in Atlanta. And the governor asked Mr. Moore to head up this group and said, The state of Georgia will back you men up 100% in any recommendation you make. They came to Reesville, and we were driven out of this old muddy river bottoms into this old dark cell house. And Mr. Moore said, open the door. I want to go in here and talk to these men. And they said, you can't go in there because it's too dangerous. And this was the first time in my life I ever heard anybody talk about God in a respectful manner. Mr. Moore said, I prayed before I came down here. And I'm not afraid to go in there. And he wasn't. They opened the door. He came in. And we followed him to the rear of this old cell house, and we sat down in a big circle. And Mr. Moore sat down in the center of this group with tears just flowing down his face. And he brought us a message. He talked about the God of his understanding. He said, it's not for sale. You can't buy it. And the most amazing thing of all, he said, you don't have to be good to get it. It's a gift. I could not, for the life of me, understand this kind of talk. But I never forgot that message. And for many, many years after that, while out digging stumps, digging ditches, I would think about that message that man brought me. I never forgot it. 
He said, I'm going to let your hair grow out so you look like a human being. I'm going to take them old stripes and those old chains off of you. He said, I'm going to let you pick any job in this institution that you want that you might learn a trade that will be worthwhile to you one day on the streets. He said, I don't care how many life sentences you're serving. If any man in this detail would just do five years with a perfect record, I guarantee you a parole. What an opportunity. There was only one man in that detail that taken advantage of that great opportunity. And he's the only one that I know of, other than myself, that's still living today. He did learn a trade. He did do five years. He was paroled. He's no grandpa now. He never got back in. But you know what kind of job I asked for? I asked for a job down in Stewart's department. Now, that's where they got all that meal and syrup and sugar and yeast. <laughs> I intended to stay drunk. And I did. A lot of people ask me, poor boy, how in the world do you drink in the penitentiary? I got news for you there, honey. Reesville, back in those days, it was easier to get than it is up there in Rockdale County where I live. You didn't have to walk as far as it. Now, out here they call it beer, but in the penitentiary we call it buck. And it ain't nothing but old still beer. And I guarantee you, you sure get drunk off that stuff. And so I stayed drunk. And for the next few years, there was a lot of things happening. A lot of them were tragedies. I don't, I can't talk about them. But there's a lot of humor along the way. I like to look at the humor side of life. And there was a lot of humor. Now, most everybody goes by some kind of a nickname. Now, they call me Po Boy. And I had a little old buddy there. He, he had a nickname, too. They called him Hitler. Hitler would weigh just about 75 pounds soaking wet. And if there's anybody in Reesville that loved that old buck as good as I did, it was old Hitler. <clears throat> and I remember one morning I got up there and I pulled off a batch of buck, and old Hitler got drunk. And he got out in the hall and he got arrested on a plain drunk charge. <laughs> and they had him down at the control office and the warden said, Hitler, where'd you get that buck at? And he pulled his hat off and he bowed over real humbly and he said, Captain, you can just whoop this old head of mine till it rattles like a pot of okra if you want to. But I ain't gonna say one word against my good friend Pobo Rice. <laughs> <laughs> Old Hitler swore he didn't snitch on me. <clears throat> you know, he didn't know how they found it out. But then it, many other times, we'd have to go upstairs and eat bread and water for a few days. That was just a merry-go-round. That's what I was doing time. But I used this little extra privilege I had of mixing and mingling with the other convicts, scheming, plotting, planning. And after a while, I got me an old pistol smuggled in there with a Prince Albert can full of bullets. And I got up there one morning, and I was so drunk, I didn't know I was in this world. And I enticed five of those other men to help me. And we captured 19 of those free people, and we had them all tied up in haywire, used as hostage trying to go out the back gate with them. Now, I thought I wanted out bad, but I can honestly tell you this evening, thank God. I didn't get through those gates then, because if I had, I certainly wouldn't have been living today. And anything that I tell you that happened to me, don't you feel sorry for poor boy. I asked for every bit of it. I was in this fellowship for quite a while before I realized and accepted the fact I am responsible for my actions. But I had always blamed people, places, and things for the condition that I was in. And so they stripped me off naked, and I was beaten till I was bloody to heart, and they carried me to the death house. And there I remained for the next two and a half years, right in the shadow of the Georgia electric chair, for safekeeping. 
My folks didn't know where I was. I was not allowed any visitors or any male privilege, and I had no money. And if I ever got a cigarette, one of those condemned prisoners would give me a cigarette. Now, they don't use that thing very often today, but during those years, the state of Georgia was leading this nation in executions, and I had a ringside seat. This did not make a Christian out of me, but it certainly did change my mind about a lot of things. A lot of these men were young men, and while under the influence of alcohol, they had committed some crime against society that they had to pay for with their lives, and they did. Two and a half years later, I came back to population, and I had a thought like this. When I go again, I'll go out that front door, a free man. I'll go out that back gate in the pine box. I give up. I can't beat you. And in my way of thinking, for the next seven years, I made what I called a good record. Now, I stayed drunk most of the time but I stopped trying to escape. And I never made a record like this in my life. And by this time, we had a pardon and a parole board in Georgia. Before that, we had a prison commission, which was consisted of three men. They were the whole works in Georgia. And every year, the pardon and parole board, they would come down and talk to me. Sometimes they'd make a recording of my attitude and get back up to Capitol and play it. But after seven years, Mr. Ed Everett was chairman of the pardon and parole board, and he came down there, and he interviewed me. And he said, Poe boy, we feel like you've been in long enough, but you've been too closely confined for too many years to be turned out with the public. I didn't know anything about World War II. I had no trade. I didn't know how to live in our society. And that man knew more about me than I knew about myself. He said, I'm going to recommend that they send you back out to a road camp and let you mix and mingle with the people out there. And when you get used to being around folks, then we're going to give you a parole. And so they transferred me up to Cobb County. And they sent me up on trial, and they told my kin folks, said if he'll stay up there one year and try to do right, and don't leave, said, we're going to give him a parole. Well, I felt like a misdemeanor then. I'd count the months off, the weeks, the days, until that year was up. <clears throat> and they sent me a letter and said, stay another year. And I'd like to broke my heart. I was a real weak individual, and I didn't know how to deal with disappointment. So I got full of resentments and anger, and that old attitude came back, I'll get even. And I thought, when my folks come out here Sunday, I'm going to get what little money they got, and I'm going to leave because I could have very well left then. But all these years I'd been gone, my little old brother and sister had grown up, and they had families of their own. And they had all become church people. I never could understand why they didn't talk to me about God. I guess I just thought I was a hopeless case. But as my sister came out there that Sunday morning, she brought me another little message. I like to look at it this way. All the way down through life, at different times, different incidents, there were some little seeds that were planted that began to sprout and come towards the surface until one day, thank God, they blossomed out in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sister says, I know you don't have a God, but I do. She said, there's a lot of people praying for you that you don't even know. Don't do anything till the capital opens in the morning and let me get back up there. And I owed my sister a lot because she had run her legs off for many, many years trying to help me. But then, just like my mother, I had took her for granted. You are my sister. You're supposed to do these things. I told her I'd wait. And the very next evening, when I came in from work, I said, Poor boy, you stay in in the morning. There'll be somebody up here to get you, and they're going to carry you up to the Capitol. The board wants to talk to you some more. I 
couldn't hardly sleep that night on that old bunk for thinking about a God that my sister had so much faith in. Sure enough, they carried me up to the Capitol. There's a lot of people up there representing me. I didn't even know them. They're just friends of my family. And, of course, they didn't tell me what they were going to do other than they were going to reconsider. And we'll let you know in about 10 days or two weeks what our final decision is. And I suppose it was about that long until I was paroled. And I'd been in 20 years, one month, and two weeks. And back in those days, when you made parole, somebody would have to come pick you up and carry you home and bring you some clothes to wear home. And my sister brought me a sports shirt and a pair of slacks. And this was the first time in my life that I had ever owned a pair of breeches with a zipper on them. (laughs) Now, I'm here to tell you that turned me on. I'd catch myself standing in front of the mirror going, zip, zip, zip. (laughs) This is what I was like. And I came home, and every time the doors of the church was open, my people all went. And it was sort of a take it or leave it proposition. Now, you can go with us, or you can stay here by yourself. And so out of curiosity, I went. And I went for all the wrong reasons. I met a lot of wonderful people up there, people who wanted to help me. But a person who had lived like I had so long with this wall around me, I didn't trust people. And I kept everybody at a distance, and I wouldn't let you get close to me. And I refused the help that was offered. But there was one good thing that came out of me going to church up there. This is where I met this little old lady here, old Flo. And a short time later, me and old Flo, we got married. We rented some furnished rooms, and two men in that church got me a job digging ditches for a plumbing company. I'm a good ditch digger. (laughs) And I went to digging ditches, and me and old Flo would go to meeting on Sunday. And I didn't drink liquor during this time. And after a while, they... Gave me a dime raise and made me a plumber's heifer. And I continued on going to meeting, not drinking liquor, and after a while, I got one of those little old cards that said that I was a journeyman plumber. And I said, now I can make some money. And I went out to Emory University and I got me a job as plumber. I could just about wear my house shoes to work every morning. And I worked out there for two years. And one morning they called me in the office and said, Po boy, Emory is a big thing, and there's a lot of folks know Po boy. And you're not supposed to work out here with your record. And said, Some of the higher ups have found out who you are, and we're going to have to let you go. I'd like to have broke my heart. I still didn't know how to deal with disappointment. So what happened? I got full of anger, resentment, and that old attitude, I'll get even. And we know what happens when this comes along. And that old false pride wouldn't let me go home and tell Flo what had happened because she would have understood and we could have worked it out. But every morning I'd let her put that bread and meat in a sack and I'd cut out like I was going to work and I didn't have a job and I didn't want a job. I was full of anger. I didn't know anything about legalized liquor. And I walked into one of those honky-tonks that next morning. And this is the way I started getting even. I started drinking that stuff. And after a while, I'd be in a condition that I had too much respect for Flo and I wouldn't go home. I didn't want her to see me like that. And most of the time, I'd just walk the streets of Atlanta all night by myself and cry. Poor, pitiful, and put upon. Nobody loves me. Nobody under... I don't want you to think I had self-pity now. (laughs) This is just the way it was, and it wasn't too long until I couldn't go home because the police were looking for me. And I knew I was going to have to run again. 
And I want to see old Flo just one more time before I run. And I got my brother to go pick Flo up and bring her out to meet me out there at a little old motel where South 75 is now. And we spent the night out there. And the next morning I woke up, it was on Sunday morning, the sun was shining so bright, and I walked up to the bus stop with Flo. And I stood there and I watched Flo get on that bus going back home. Lord, I wanted to go home with close to bed. I didn't know what to do. I thought the most precious thing I've ever had in my life, and now I'm losing that. I've bloated again. And so I run. And I went to another state. The trouble was I carried poor boy women. That's where the problem had been all the time. And that liquor in these other states just like it is in Georgia. And a few days later, the police picked me up in D.T. just as crazy as a bat. They called Atlanta, and they sent and got me and brought me back over here. And my people put up their home and everything else they had to make a $10,000 bond to get back out on the streets, walk the streets, feel sorry for Pobo and drink liquor. And I run again. This time I went to Tennessee. I didn't know nobody up there. I just drunk and got on the bus and went up there. In the wee hours of the morning, there was a black man sitting out beside him. And I said, I don't think I need to go down to the bus station. He said, I don't either. I said, well, you tell me how to get off this bus before I get down there. He said, get off with me. I ain't going down there either. So we got off the bus up there in Chattanooga somewhere. We went off there, and there was a black man who had a pint of whiskey, and he wouldn't sell it to me unless we'd let him hit drink it. And I bought it, and we all three sat down on the chop block out in the wood pile, and we drank that pint of liquor. And there wasn't any more down there, so ain't no need me staying. And I wandered on back up on the main streets of Chattanooga looking for some more liquor and looking for somebody to talk to. And there wasn't nobody out there but me. And I saw those light, neon light flashing, fancy wine, liquor. And I said, well, listen, Bob. But it wasn't. They just had all the lights on. And I could stand there and look through that big plate glass wonder at all these shelves that come right up there, and it had half a pint, filth, quartz. And I hauled off and hit that glass with my fist, and the whole thing fell out all over me. And I cut my hand, and I didn't have something enough to know I was cut. And I just stood there and filled my pockets full of them bottles. And waddled on up the sidewalk and fishing for a cigarette. My tie, my shirt was bloody, my pocket was full of blood. And the police run up there and throw the shotgun on me and carried me back down there. And I lied like a dog. I said I didn't do that. <laughs> and they said, how in the world are you going to deny something like this? I said, I don't know, but I am and I did. <laughs> Well, they put me on in jail, and the next morning there was a city detective that had me down there trying to question me. And I was about to go into convulsions. And he didn't want me to die on his hands, and he said, I'm going to do something for you, now don't you say nothing about it. And he went back there, and he got a glass that high full of liquor. And he said, drink that. Boy, that's a good drink of liquor. And they kept me in jail for five weeks. And one evening, just about dark, in the wintertime, they called me downstairs and said the grand jury failed to indict you. And they opened the door and said, get, and I got. <laughs> and I thought they had made a mistake, and I run five blocks just as hard as I could till they give out. And I said, now, these people ain't all that crazy. I couldn't understand that. I never knew why those people turned me loose until about three years ago, I guess, I was in Merville, Tennessee, C.D. And there was a judge <clears throat> over there. And I was talking to him about that. He said, Poor boy, do you remember something very unusual that happened to you that next morning? I said, yeah, that man, give me a drink of liquor. And he laughed. He said, I know why they turned you loose. He said, I came to this fellowship 31 years ago, and he said, I went to work on a garbage truck. And he said, after a while, I became a city fireman. And then I got on the police department, and then I became a city detective. And now I said, I'm judge. 
And he said, this old boy that give you that drink of liquor said he was a member of this fellowship. And said, he is the man that went before the grand jury in your behalf, and he told those people, that guy is an alcoholic. And if you just turn that idiot loose, he'll go back to Georgia, and we won't have to fool with him. <laughs> so I found out why they turned me out after all those years. I made my way back to Flo just to get what little money she had, walked the streets, drank liquor, and feel sorry for poor boy. And about that time, an old buddy of mine got out of the penitentiary. We'd been running together for many years. So one evening, him and I was going up that four-lane highway right near Marietta, both of us drunk and old beat-up Ford. And we had a flat tire, and right across the expressway was a filling station. So we went over there and bought a tire from that man. He said, pull your car over in the yard, and I'll put the tire on for you. So here's two drunks trying to get that old Ford across the expressway, and there's a Thunderbird dealer, and his family from up in Ohio was on the way to Florida on vacation. And they run over us and tore up our car. And like two idiots, we jumped out and took the other away from them. I don't know about your insanity, I know about mine. <laughs> that just seemed to me like right at that particular time, this was the normal thing to do. Hey man, you done tore up my car, give me yours. But it don't work that way either. And so they run me and this old boy into a roadblock. And it wasn't so much as what we had done, but because of our past. And they tried me and this old boy, and they gave us 20 more years of peace and sent us both back to Reesville. If I'd have had the nerve, I'd have cut my throat. I couldn't see no way to live 20 more years in there. I didn't know how to pray. Thank God old Flo did. And I believe a lot of other people did. And I like to look at it this way. Fourteen months later, God answered somebody's prayer. And it was far different from anything I could imagine. Because they transferred me over to Stone Mountain. And they was building a new prison camp over there. And they sent me up there to put the plumbing in this new prison camp. And when we finished that new prison, the warden had us to install a little chapel out in one end of the mess hall. And he called me out on the front, out of all people, and he said, Poor boy, I have a different assignment for you every Sunday afternoon. He said, Because we're going to have a church group from all over this area that will be coming out here holding services. And he said, I want you to stand by the door and welcome the visitors. He said, I'm going to get a bunch of song books, and I want you to go back there and get a form of choir out of those convicts, and I want you to lead the singing. <laughs> of all the silly things. And you know, I like to look at it this way. These little seeds that had been planted all the way down through life, they were just about ready to come to the top. Because all of a sudden, I wasn't just sorry I'd been caught up with. I was sorry for what I had done. I wanted to do what he asked me to do, but I wasn't in no shape to do that. I don't believe in straddling that fence. I believe in being what you are. You know, our program tells us half measures are very less nothing. I didn't know how to pray, but I found me an altar. And it was an old black burnt hickory stump out in the woods. I'll never forget as long as I live when I dropped down on my knees by that old stump. And I said, God, if there is a God, whoever you are and wherever you at, I give what's left old poor boy to you. I ain't going to run no more. I'm tired. Lord, I'm tired of that old way. God did something more poor boy that day. Never get tired of telling it. Since that day and since that hour, I've never wanted to rob, wanted to rob steal, or kill nobody since then. I want to share something else with you. He left me an alcoholic. I hope unto God I don't never see that day when I think I'm cured. I went back in and I did what the warden asked me to do. I did welcome those visitors. And I led the singing. And I went back there and I formed a choir out of those convicts. 
And the good Lord sent one of those honky-tonk piano players in and I put that joker to playing gospel music and formed a quartet. <laughs> Honey, you ought to heard some of my singing. <clears throat> it was kind of a cross between George Beverly Shea and Piano Reed. <laughs> but I enjoyed doing it. He let me go out in the front yard with a bulldozer and I built a baptizing pool and run hot and cold water out there. Oh, we turned it on. <laughs> I still had that number on the seat of my britches, but old Flo could come out there every Sunday evening and sit in those services, and I felt different. Felt different. Something had happened. And I like to look at it this way. This God I talk about don't have to be in a great big hurry about anything. He's always right on time. And I did that for the next five years. And one morning somebody said, Poe, I just seen old Flo go around the corner up there with your Sunday britches. It like scared me to death. I thought some of my kin folks had died. Maybe I was going to the funeral. But that wasn't the way it was. Miss Rebecca Garrett was living then, and she was chairman of the party and parole board. Maybe she still had a little faith in me. I don't know. But somewhere between six and seven years there, she had decided to probe me again. And Flo and I went home that morning. We didn't have a dollar and a half between us. We still couldn't hire a lawyer, but we knew where our help had come from. I went back to work at plumbing work for the next three years. I didn't drink liquor. Then I got tied in with a gospel singing group. We moved around a lot singing. Three more years, and I didn't drink liquor. And then I taken a job as maintenance man for a big motel. And of course, with all the conventions they had, the liquor and the beer was flowing very freely. And I didn't have sense enough to know I'm an alcoholic. I can take it. I can leave it. I haven't had a drink in many years. One day I decided I'd drink one of those good old cold Budweiser's like them other boys are doing. And I did. My friends, when we're reading that big book that this is a progressive illness and it always gets worse and it never gets better, please believe that. It's so true. I didn't get drunk that day or that night, but I kept on till I did get drunk. And this was the worst drunk I'd ever been on in my life. There wasn't no turning back. And I stayed down drunk for one solid year. This is when the terror, despair, the fear, I never knew what fear really was until that last year of the practice of an alcoholic. Flo didn't know what to do with me. Nobody knew what to do with me. Finally, somebody told Flo, said, put him over in Peachtree Parkwood. She did. I went in there drunk and come out drunk. They had a little deal going over there back in those days. The first three days you was in there, every two hours around the clock, they'd give you two ounces of 180 proof alcohol and a little fruit juice. They call it that tapering you off. You better believe every two hours around the clock, I'd be standing at that nurse's station waiting for my medicine. And then all them pills is rolling at me. And I found that doctor to let me stay on it an extra day because I was a real nervous person. So when I came out, I was still drunk. We'd spent what little money we had, and the insurance was used up. And from then on, I'd have to go just wherever they'd take me. And I made the rounds, all of them. The last alcoholic hospital I was in was over that GMHI. And I'm sure it would have been the same old merry-go-round with exceptions of one thing on Monday night. They had an AA meeting out there. And so they announced on the loudspeaker that they had an AA meeting out in the lobby. And so once again, out of curiosity, I went out there, you know, to see what these cats are putting down. And there was a very dear lady friend that was in that, a mine that was in that meeting that night, and she said I looked more like a dead man than anybody she'd ever seen. And she came over to me after the meeting, and she said, Poor boy, do you want to get sober and stay sober? And I said, Yes, ma'am. I sure God do, but I don't know how. 
She said, I'm not going to try to tell you how to do it, but I'll be glad to tell you how I did it. And that got my attention because all my life, folks have been telling me, you've got to do this, you better do that. And here's somebody going to share with me something they did. And I listened to them. She gave me her phone number. And the morning I left that hospital, that was the most important phone call I ever made in my life. I called Sue. And she got the little meeting book out and looked up the closest meeting to where I was living at in Stone Mountain, which is the Glen Haven Stone Mountain group. It used to be the Glen Haven group. She said, they got a meeting over there tonight. You get yourself over there. And I went. And this is when I count my sobriety date. It was uh, my day, first day a meeting outside of an institution, which was December the 12th in 73. And I could just imagine all kind of questions those people were going to ask me. Who sent you over him? Have you ever been convicted of a felony? <laughs> they asked me this everywhere else I went. And I decided I was going to lie about everything that they asked me. But when I walked in there that night, those people didn't care nothing about who I was and where I came from. They said, do you want to stop drinking liquor? And I said, Lord, yes. She said, sit down. And I sat down. And I sat there that night, and it was a discussion meeting, and I heard those guys and those gals say, my name's so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. I said, my God, if this is what an alcoholic is, with all those smiling faces, and all this fellowship that I see here, and they are alcoholics. What in the world am I? What am I? Now, I know a lot of people have trouble with that first step. I didn't. I picked up some hope there that night. If I can just find out what these people are doing, maybe there's some hope for me. And so I made a decision. If this is what an alcoholic is, I wanted to be an alcoholic more than anything in the world. I didn't want to be what I was. <clears throat> I said, what do I have to do to be like you folks? Now, see, they know that I was a fool. And they kept it very simple. They said, don't drink and go to meetings. Well, that was simple. I could understand that. So I didn't drink. And I went to meetings. And after a while, I kind of got the wrinkles out of my belly, and I got to where I could eat. And then I got to where I could lay down at night and go to sleep. Believe me, that was good. And I could get up in the morning, put my britches on, and go to work. The flow got a whole lot better to me, too. And I'd go to meeting, and after a while, I got to where I could smile, and I could laugh. And I said, well, I guess sanity has returned. <laughs> I'm the only person in my home group that I know of to ever give a birthday in six months. <clears throat> the night I had six months without the drink, the man who eventually became my sponsor, I just hated him then, his little old wife baked me a cake and brought it and said six months on it, oh boy. And I thought, I never have had a birthday party in my life. Tonight I got a birthday party given to me by a bunch of sober drunks. Well, every six months they'd get them a new secretary. So I had my six month birthday party and they made me secretary of the group. See, they wanted me to keep, they wanted to make sure I'd be there. But I misunderstood. I thought, now I own my own group. <laughs> And after a while, I went on and celebrated a showing up birthday. And I lost my job as secretary. <laughs> now, I'd been on this little pink cloud that we talk about sometimes. I got right straddle of that sucker. I laughed after I lost my job as secretary. Just don't do, take no action other than this, don't drink and go to meeting. Those meetings started getting a little bit dull and a little bit boring. 
And the old boy that I was most critical of, of anybody else in there, because every time he would be sharing, he'd say what the big book says when he be there. I didn't want to hear that. I always thought I was doing all this myself. I didn't like it. My friends, that almost got me drunk. As close as I've come to getting drunk since I got to the, this fellowship. Because one of those big lumps that we talk about came along and fell in my lap, and I didn't know how to deal with it. And I left my house, and I went to the liquor store. I intended to get drunk. I knew I was going to get drunk, not really wanting to get drunk. And as I sat there in the parking lot of that liquor store, I remember something an old time I shared with me right after coming in the program. And he said, poor boy, he said, I sat in the parking lot once night, and I watched my wife and little children go back down the road going home to her parents because as a practicing alcoholic, I couldn't support them. And he said, I bowed over that stirring wheel, and I asked God to help me. And he said, to help King. And I remembered that right at that moment, and I too. I said, God, I can't help myself. Please take that craving away from me. Don't let me get drunk. The help came. I haven't wanted to drink a liquor from that day to this. I turned around went back home, and I went back to my group. And I knew that if I was going to stay sober, there was a little bit more to it than just don't drink and go to meetings. And I knew I didn't have sense enough to do this by myself. And guess who became my sponsor? This old boy that was always talking about the big book. And I went to him and I said, would you consider being my sponsor? He said, poor boy, this is an honor that you asked me to be sponsor somebody like you. I said, what's the big deal? I mean, I've already seen you celebrate a birthday. And here all of a sudden you feel that you need a sponsor. And I said, well, my program ain't working too good right now. And he said, oh, yes, it is. He said, it was your program that got you to our program, and it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, if I'm going to be your sponsor, the first thing that you're going to have to do, or we're going to have to do, is get rid of your program before you get drunk. <laughs> now, if the good Lord's willing, I hope to be with this old boy down in Mississippi next week. This man that I despise, so in the beginning, I love him like a brother today, that man got me in to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't have sense enough to do a four-step inventory, but with his help, he got me into a four-step, and would you believe I found some flaws in my personality? <laughs> Yes, most of them buried deep under those thick layers of self-justification. And I made this searching moral inventory. And when I had went as far as I knew how to go with this, I called him up one morning. I said, I have finished my fourth step. I want to do the fifth. He said, say what? I said, I didn't finish my fourth step. He said, you got a 12 and 12? I said, yeah. He said, turn to page 15. I did. He said, what did it say? I said, it said, made a beginning on a lifetime practice. He said, you through yet? I said, no. <laughs> he said, you done went as far as you can? I said, yeah. He said, bring in the car and come on over him. My wife stayed upstairs with his wife. He took the big book and I took my inventory and we went to the basement and locked the door. Now, we talk about the spiritual awakening that comes as a result of these stair, uh, steps. My friends, there were some spiritual experiences along the way, and that was a ditty on step five. When I talked with another human being about the exact nature of some of my wrongs, some of these things I thought I would have carried to the graveyard with me. I'll never forget it as long as I live. It's beautiful. This old boy was transferred several years ago down to Jackson, Mississippi. I get to see him not too often, 
But I can write him. He can write me, and I can call him every once in a while. I got me another one. In fact, I got two now. And ain't neither one of them been sober as long as I have. But that ain't what I look for in a sponsor. It's not quantity, but quality. And they're all a lot of help to me, too. This is the way the program started for me. This is the way it is. This is my life today. This is the only life I've ever known, except that old dark, ugly, and negative side. I know everything that there is to know about that side of life. This is a brand new adventure, old poor boy Rice. And every day that the good Lord lets come along, it's a brand new challenge to be of service to the God of my understanding and try to help somebody else. There's been so many things that have happened to me, unbelievable things, since I got in this fellowship and got active. And as far as I'm concerned, action is a key word. The first part of 79, at the age of 66, I retired. And all I had was my little Social Security check. And we couldn't pay that high rent up there in Stone Mountain. And me and old Flo moved back to Rockdale County, where we are today, and we moved into a little old government housing project. Now, I want to share something with you. There's a difference between a house and a home. As a little old boy, when I lived down there, it was an old house. Today, in that little old government apartment, it's a home, thank God. What makes it a home? Is because we have each other, we have love, we have God in our lives, and we have this beautiful fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. All my life, I had always got my needs and my wants mixed up. By today, by God's grace, my needs are being met. There's something happened to me several years ago after being out of prison for 13 years. This don't happen to many people in the state of Georgia unless they can prove their innocence, and of course I couldn't do that. But I received a full unconditional pardon from the state of Georgia. And I sat down and cried. First time I'd ever been free since I was a little boy. Today I don't have a record, not even running a stop sign. Wipe clean. Now, it's good, my friends, to get out of jail. That's a good feeling. But to be free in the spirit, as I feel this evening, that's better than getting out of jail. I don't have that vocabulary to put in words what I feel. But I'm so glad that this God of my understanding, who knows all things, and I don't know nothing, one day he reached down and he picked old Poboy up off of a junk pile and he gave me a new lease on life. He gave me something worth living for. He gave me a purpose for living. I don't understand why I'm down here this evening, but I'm just down here and I ain't running nothing. Be careful what you pray for, because I prayed one time and I told him I'd go where he wanted me to and do what he wanted me to do. So that's his business. It ain't none of mine. And any time I'm in a meeting, if whether it's a big meeting or a little meeting, my heart and my mind is always centered on that new man or woman just coming in the door. Because I remembered one day when I was you, and I remember how suspicious and how skeptical I was of everything. So in closing, let me share one thing with you, my friends, to the newcomer. That the problem ahead, I don't care what it is or how big it is, it is never, never, never greater than this source of power that I've been trying my level best to share with you here this evening. Thank you. God love you. I love all of you. Thank you, committee.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.